we've had a series of crises in the last, uh, you know, 40 years or so, um, starting with the SNL crisis, the Latin American debt crisis, the Asian crisis, then the Argentinian and Brazilian crisis, and uh, the global financial crisis most recently. And uh, what I want to do is, you know, we've, we've uh, had about 10 years since the crisis. And um, I want to talk a little bit about the proximate causes, because there's been a fair amount of research recently, and give you a theory of, of what the causes might be. Uh, and I want to relate that to liquidity, uh, and I'll tell you why I'm doing that uh, once, once I finish. Um, and and uh, once I talk about why liquidity may explain how we got to the crisis, I want to talk about one of the problems that we saw in the crisis. So here is a graph of uh, the distribution of financial conditions across countries. Higher is easier. And what you see is leading up to the financial crisis, you have a tremendous easing of financial conditions. And then during the crisis, you have this extremely uh, tight, uh, sharp tightening of financial conditions, which very soon alleviates. Uh, by the middle of uh, 2009, you see financial conditions alleviating. And of course, since then, we have a tremendous infusion of uh, liquidity by the central banks, and financial conditions have become much easier since then. So I want to talk a little bit in, uh, today about the lead up to the crisis and what happened during the crisis, and then end with some speculation of what we have now, okay? So leading up to the crisis, what we see is extremely easy financial conditions. And here are two graphs taken from various papers, uh, which essentially say that, one, monetary policy was very easy. If you look at Taylor rule residuals, they were largely negative over the period leading to the financial crisis in, uh, in, in Europe. Uh, if you look at standards for corporate loans, which is another measure of corporate credit tightness. You see, that was also very easy and tightened soon after monetary policy started tightening. Remember, the ECB started tightening before the crisis. Financial conditions also started tightening, whether it's taken as corporate loans or lending standards for mortgage loans, okay? Uh, similarly, in the US, and here uh, the time uh, for this graph is a little different, but focus on the right-hand side. If you look 2000 and uh, and one, 2002 onwards. Again, you see Taylor Rule residuals are negative in the US, suggesting monetary policy was quite easy relative to the past. And you can look at financing conditions. Lending standards are easy, tightening before the crisis, and similarly for mortgage loans. Okay, so what are the consequences of easy financing conditions? Um, what Borio and Loeb drew our attention to way back was uh, when you see a combination of high credit growth and rising asset prices, you should be screaming fire because things get bad after that, okay? More recently, we've got a number of papers which sort of do it in more detail. Uh, when you have froth in credit markets, you have strong credit growth as well as very low credit spreads. In fact, Krishnamurti and Morris show that before a crisis, the credit growth and spreads are negatively correlated. So just to show you the graph, what you see is spreads are really low. Around the time the crisis starts, spreads widen. So these are credit spreads. Just before the crisis, credit spreads widen. Look at the path of credit growth, which is on the right-hand side. Again, credit expands substantially until the point of crisis. Then it starts contracting substantially. And GDP, similarly, uh, growth is high before the crisis and then contracts. So the question that you want to ask is, you know, what's going on? And obviously, in, in these kinds of, uh, of uh, uh, sort of graphs, you can offer a behavioral explanation that perhaps what's going on is people don't anticipate the crisis, and then things switch around once something happens. Now, um, there's also, let, let me offer two sets of explanations that are, are behavioral. One is the agency behavioral. 
Um, and um, the classic example of the agency behavior, the uh, uh, kind of herd behavior in banking markets is the perhaps the most famous statement be made before the crisis, which was by Chuck Prince, the chairman of Citibank, who essentially said for the FT, when the music stops in terms of liquidity, things will get complicated, but as long as the music's playing, you've got to get up and dance, and we're still dancing. That, to many, was the classic statement about herd behavior. I actually met him at a conference once, and I asked him, so why did you say that? Uh, <laughs> And it was interesting because it was a very thoughtful response. He said, look, I had a whole bunch of investment bankers who were doing deals. And I saw the quality of deals falling, but the point was if I stopped them from doing more deals, they would have walked, they would have left immediately. And getting people is tough. So in an attempt to preserve the franchise, so to speak, I had to let them go a little more to the edge. Now, of course, he was making a calculation that retaining these people was more important than the cost to the balance sheet in terms of, uh, of deteriorating credit, and it came back to haunt him. But, uh, but nevertheless, there was a rationale, which is, since everybody's going, I gotta keep going. There are various sort of herd behavior models, sometimes based on, I gotta keep up the pretense that I'm, I have really good credits and I have really good business, otherwise the market uh, my stock price will tank. Let me keep up that pretense by making additional loans, ignoring the losses or papering over the losses, evergreening. You can write down models like this, and I, I, I have, but, but the point is that these are all in a class of behavioral models. And then there is the true behavioral model where your beliefs, in some sense, are affected by what you see. I think the classic paper here is, uh, Janayal, I always, Janaioli, Janaioli, okay, I'm going with apologies to Janaioli, Schleifer and Vishni, which is uh, about uh, the fact that if I see a string of good news, I tend to overweight the probability that good news will continue, that conditions will remain really good. I think that that is, in a sense, representative of conditions. And of course, once I start seeing bad news, uh, it takes some time for me to flip, but eventually I flip and then I go exactly the opposite way. So I veer from over-optimism to over-pessimism. There's the uh, work by Ginocopoulos, uh, where essentially when you have a combination of the possibilities of leverage, as well as a variety of people, optimists and pessimists, because the optimists can borrow to invest in assets, you get a preponderance of optimists in the upswing, but then when you get to the downswing, because these are highly levered, they go bust, they go out of the market, and now you have a preponderance in a sense of pessimists, and, and you get a switch in terms of asset prices. So these kinds of explanations could, could, could be useful in seeing that abrupt shift uh, that, that we saw. What I'm gonna try is an explanation associated with liquidity. It's not testing these other models and saying my model is better than your model or anything of that sort. I'm offering you a model based on liquidity because I'm gonna offer you uh, actually two models based on liquidity. Liquidity bad is the first, liquidity good is the second, and then we're gonna uh, talk about policy implications. So um, back to the question, why does leverage increase and spreads decline? Why does the real recovery take so long? What role does liquidity or easy financing conditions play? And the argument here is going to be that when you have plentiful liquidity, when you have easy financing conditions, there's a certain form of borrowing that is encouraged, and that picks up. But in that process, when money is really easy, other forms of enforcing borrowing get neglected. So those are uh, those are forms of uh, enforcing repayment which are very valuable in bad times, but because times are so good, you tend to neglect that. And then when the bad times come, there's nothing available because the liquidity which made for easy borrowing in the good times has disappeared and this other source of enforcing uh, is not there because you didn't need it. And the connection between the two is made by leverage. So that's the first part. I'm gonna talk about that. Then I'll talk about the spike downwards, why that might. So the, the point in this, the, uh, the paper uh, that uh, uh, it's with Doug Diamond and 
Yanzi Ho from uh, 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 North Carolina, uh, is that expectations of high future liquidity can make the subsequent downturns much worse. And this is not just through changed expectations of leverage, but it's through some real change, and I'm going to talk about that. So, um, I'm not, trust me, no, no Greek alphabets, nothing here. I'm going to walk through three or four slides explaining the details of the model, and it should be relatively easy to catch. So, when you think about debt contracts, what are the ways that debt contracts are enforced? Well, one way, uh, uh, largely popularized by Oliver Hart and John Moore, is through an asset sale. The creditor can threaten to seize and sell the firm to an acquirer, and this is something that works very well uh, when there is a boom, when there's plentiful liquidity, where by liquidity we mean the capacity of bidders to pay because of their own wealth and so on. So um, when you have wealthy industry insiders, they can buy any asset that is put up for sale. That makes the asset very good collateral to borrow against. And that makes it very easy for creditors to enforce debt payments because they just seize the asset, sell it to somebody else in case you refuse to pay. So, for example, uh, in the construction industry, when you have plentiful liquidity, when there's easy financing available all, all around, what happens is there are plen plenty of people who want to take on uh, mortgages, they get those mortgages. Now think about what happens in construction companies. Construction companies are able to uh, build the house and sell it immediately. Lots of construction companies sitting with lots of wealth because they're making money hand over fist. So any kind of asset in this construction industry, including construction firms, become very liquid in this environment because you have very easy financing and that flows back to firms. Now this is an environmental thing, it's exogenous to the firm. A second way that you can borrow, which is uh, a harder way, is not against collateral, but in some sense by promising to have better corporate governance. By promising that whatever cash flows you generate, they will be properly accounted for, they will go into escrow accounts, they will be paid out to, to lenders. So uh, a second way, which we call pledging cash flows, is an incumbent uh, manager of a firm can borrow by essentially committing to uh, pay whatever cash flows he generates to creditors in case he owes them debt. So if you have tighter accounting disclosure, tighter covenants, you have strong external governance, a strong board, essentially you close down uh, what Andre calls tunnels, ways that people can take money out of the firm you close them down, you keep the money inside the firm so that it can be funneled to the lenders. So the point about this is it's internal. This kind of governance is internal. It's not based on external conditions. The firm itself is improving its ability to repay. It takes time to set up and it attaches to the firm. Typically, many of these institutional structures attach to the firm. This is endogenous. Now, the two modes interact. Essentially, if somebody can borrow against the firm itself in making a bid for the firm, they can actually pay more for the firm. So I have plenty of wealth myself as an industry insider, but if in addition I can borrow against the firm when I bid for the firm, I can pay more for the firm. So these two can add up. Essentially, the ability to pledge cash flows of the firm can add up to industry wealth to allow for greater borrowing capacity. Okay? So that's one way these two interact. But there's a second way, a more damaging way they interact. And this is, this is problematic. When there's plenty of liquidity, when industry insiders themselves have plenty of cash to pay, they can pay full value for the firm. At that point, they don't need the additional pledgeability against the assets. So in a sense, liquidity, plenty of liquidity in the industry crowds out the incentive for firms to maintain pledgeability. There's a more general point here. When financing is very easy, potential borrowers don't have to worry about being very, very circumspect, et cetera. They can borrow easily against the assets, in which case corporate governance can go for a toss, accounting can go for a toss, forensic accountants no longer find any business. Basically, there is a shift. Easy liquidity crowds out other forms 
of maintaining uh, financing capacity. So in this simple model, think about somebody borrowing to buy the firm. It is possible that the boom continues, and if we are in good times, the probability of it continuing is, is high. And that's when there's going to be easy liquidity. That's going to enforce debt payments, OK? And it, there's a small probability of a downturn. Need not be very small, can be small, but, but not, not negligible. And in this situation, a, uh, somebody who's running a firm has to set pledgeability. They borrowed. They have to set pledgeability. How do they decide to set pledgeability? Well, you have to ask, once I've borrowed, why do I need to increase pledgeability? Why do I need to make, maintain governance? And the answer is very simple. If I want to borrow again, if I think I may need to issue money in the markets, I need to maintain that governance. So if there's a prospect of new investment projects, or if I just want to sell my, my firm in the market, I want to maintain that pledgeability. So that's a reason for me to do it. Now, there is this trade-off. There is this trade-off that if I increase pledgeability, I can raise more easily, or I can sell the firm for more when I need to sell it in, in the markets, OK? So that's good for me as an incumbent. The downside is, if I increase pledgeability and I have a lot of debt outstanding, I have to pay those creditors more because now they have far more ability to extract from me. They can threaten to sell the firm. And if they sell the firm after seizing it from me, they can get a lot more because I've made it easy for bidders to bid for that firm. So really, the incentives for any firm in an environment of liquidity to set this pledgeability high, remember it's endogenous, it's something that firms set themselves, depends to some extent on how much I think I'll need new finance or how much I think I will need to sell the firm versus how much I will continue to be in the firm and need to repay, OK? It turns out, for example, if you think about the management of a mature firm with few financing needs, if you're in a mature firm with few financing needs, you don't want to maintain any corporate governance. You're not going to raise money ever. You've got plenty of money coming through operational cash flows. That's not what you need to do. On the other hand, if you're a management buyout team which has bought this firm, you know you want to sell it in a year. So in that year, you're going to do everything you can to enhance corporate governance in that firm because you want to sell it for the maximum possible, right? So depending on whether you're a, uh, a firm that's going to stay in business, a management team that's going to stay in business, or a management team that's going to sell out, your incentives vary. So that's one source of incentives. The second is debt. If I have a whole lot of debt outstanding, right, as a incumbent manager of the firm, I really don't want to increase pledgeability. Why? Because if I have to sell the firm, more of the amount I raise by selling the firm will go to pay the debt holders. Okay? On the other hand, if I increase this pledgeability significantly and make debt holders much stronger, if I stay in control of the firm, again, I have to pay out a whole lot to the debt holders. So what a higher level of debt does is reduce my incentive to increase pledgeability. OK, we're done with all the theory. Now, what does this imply? What does this imply is basically when you anticipate a lot of market liquidity, it crowds out the firm's incentive to maintain high governance. If I have a high probability in the future as a firm of having liquidity, I have a high capacity to repay debt, which means that lenders today don't worry about whether I set pledgeability high, I maintain corporate governance, et cetera. They're willing to finance me. They're running with their checkbook after me. They're saying, how much money do you want? And I take on, therefore, a lot more debt. But as I take on a lot more debt, I have very little incentive to maintain pledgeability after that. Right? So essentially, in these environments of high and continued liquidity, the prospect of this liquidity continuing does two things. It increases leverage. And once it increases leverage, it crowds out my incentive to maintain governance or maintain pledgeability. That dies out. OK, so a continuing boom 
is rising leverage because we know that the leverage can be supported by the availability of tremendous liquidity, which means the asset can be sold for a lot, and th that leverage can be repaid, that th the debt can be repaid. It means falling spreads initially as industry liquidity increases and debt becomes safer. But eventually, because pledgeability is neglected, at the last point, you will see spreads starting to increase before the crisis because the debt that's taken on is riskier. Now, what are downturns here? Downturns are when, because of tightness, the anticipated li industrial liquidity doesn't materialize. So that source of, uh, of debt capacity doesn't materialize. Uh, but also, over this period, we've neglected maintaining corporate governance, maintaining pledgeability. So pledgeability-based debt capacity is also very low. In other words, debt capacity collapses as soon as liquidity vanishes because we haven't maintained anything else. And you have a credit squeeze, you have spreads rising sharply for debt, and it takes a long while for the debt capacity to be restored because the ways it can be restored in this, this kind of model is if pledgeability is raised, that takes improvements in corporate governance. It means finding good accountants. It means finding forensic accountants. It will take time. It could also happen if industry liquidity is rebuilt. But think of a crisis. Basically, the industry insiders get squeezed. And so industry liquidity rebuilding could take a long time. Now, what are the testable implications? Uh, pledgeability falls as high liquidity persists. And there is a greater fall in industries that are undergoing booms. And eventually, when liquidity dries up, pledgeability increases. What's a measure of pledgeability? Think about accounting quality. That's a measure of pledgeability. It's whether you maintain high accounting quality or allow it to deteriorate. Well, we have a paper done by a colleague of ours, uh, uh, Mike Minnis, but uh, with Lisowski and Sutherland. And what you see here is good unqualified audits. Okay, Unqualified audits are sort of the gold star audit, which says, you know, you've, you've been, uh, uh, the auditor has looked very, very carefully at you. And the fraction of those kinds of audits indicates how much care you've taken to maintain uh, governance standards. And what you see in the blue line is for construction firms before the crisis, go up to 2007, 2008, the number of such unqualified audits in the industry is falling significantly. That's suggesting people aren't maintaining corporate governance at reasonable levels. Now, in general, there's plenty of liquidity in, in, the, in the country. So even for other firms, uh, that is the or orange line, it is declining, but it is declining more strongly for construction. And of course, with the crisis, the number of um, uh, uh, unqualified or, uh, or good audits picks up, suggesting that now they've seen the light on improving governance. Uh, what you can't see as well is the diff and diff between these two industries. What you see here sharply is for construction relative to other industries, the number, the fraction of unqualified or good audits falls tremendously before the crisis. People are just not bothering to get their firms audited in a good way before the crisis if they were in the construction industry where everybody is making money and there's no fear of the downside of how you would raise money if in fact there was tightness, and then it picks up after the crisis. Construction improves relative to the others. I thought this was an interesting um, example. So let me uh, uh, then talk a little bit about what triggered the tightness, because that also, okay, so we, what, what I have tried to explain thus far is one alternative which tells you why in a period of high liquidity, you may actually make the system more and more fragile so that when that liquidity vanishes, the system can collapse. It becomes really, really difficult to raise money because you haven't maintained corporate governance within the firms during this period of easy money. What I want to talk a little more about is the tremendous tightness. What we saw was a collapse essentially in lending uh, as the crisis hit. Uh, this, this very steep collapse. And let's talk about why that might have happened and why you saw a very fast recovery. Uh, and I'm going to argue much of it was essentially in the financial sector. So uh, we've looked at loans to firms. That's what we saw initially. And 
argued that spreads may have risen and lending tightened with the onset of the crisis. But in the financial crisis, what we saw was something far more dramatic. Liquidity dried up for a large set of financial assets with significant price drops, and the bid-ask spread just widened tremendously. When you talk to bankers, they said there's a buyer strike. Nobody's willing to buy. There's no price at which the market clears. And even well-capitalized entities shun lending. It wasn't that they couldn't lend. They didn't want to lend. And if you saw the reserves uh, at the central banks, they started picking up significantly from around the Lehman failure. So this is the sharp spike downwards, why that went down, why that went up. But if you look at, uh, for example, things like bid-ask spreads, what you see is uh, the average bid ask spread, that is the brown line uh, for, this, uh, uh, for derivatives on the leveraged loan index, essentially went up tremendously and then started coming down gently towards, and by about mid-2009 uh, or late 2009, it had come back to its old levels. Similarly, if you look at the average bid price for, uh, uh, for um, instruments on this index, collapsed. Uh, from about 90 cents to the dollar to 60, 62, 63, and then steadily climbed up. So what happened? How did it get rescued? That's, that's the next part of this in the next 10 minutes or so. Uh, there were lots during this period, a lot of arbitrage opportunities which some of the people in this room have documented. For example, the bond CDS basis uh, was essentially, so what's, for those who, who, who uh, are less familiar with this, Essentially, you can um, uh, buy the bond, uh, a corporate bond, buy CDS protection on it, and still make an arbitrage spread. Now, that arbitrage spread is money in the bank, provided the guy who sells you the CDS is willing to honor it when you go to him after the bond fails. That's a big if. That became a big if during the crisis. Before the crisis, it wasn't. It became a big concern during the crisis, and there was that spread. Of course, uh, the macro people in this room know the covered interest parity uh, also broke down during this time, and that's, that's another example of this. So there are near arbitrage opportunities, but there was a rapid recovery in asset prices. And the question there is, what happened? Why did it recover so suddenly? Was it good news on fundamentals? While we know the NBR dated the recovery from, was it March 2009? But in general, there was no evidence in the public data that there was a recovery other than perhaps uh, asset prices. The uh, unemployment stabilized only in 2010. In fact, the first month without job losses was November 2009. But by that time, you see that asset prices had recovered substantially. Similarly, if you look at delinquencies and mortgages, these declined steadily only in mid-2012. And just to show you two pictures, unemployment, goes up right till mid-2010, and look at uh, mortgage delinquencies, these stay high right till about 2012. So these are hard to pin. It's hard to pin the recovery on these things, what happened. And I want to argue that what happened, what stopped the liquidity crunch was good news on institutions, not on fundamentals. It was basically an all-clear signal, uh, which I'll argue was, the, was a stress test done by the Fed, which basically said the big institutions are safe. And once it was clear the big institutions were safe, the asset prices recovered after that. So at least that's the claim I'm going to make. So uh, to do this, again, a mini model to explain why that might have been the case, why before that we saw a freeze in, in trading, a, f uh, a fall in asset prices. Supposing you have a, a group of banks that hold assets, there are complicated assets. All these uh, en financial engineered securities, uh, leveraged loan backed CDOs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. These were assets that once they became, uh, uh, once it was known there was a substantial default risk associated with them, they had a very small market of specialized buyers. Hedge funds who knew a lot about these assets, BlackRock, maybe Vanguard, but very few uh, uh, essentially potential buyers in the market. Now, in this kind of framework, you don't need information asymmetries, you just need specialized expertise in a small set of buyers. And let's assume there are a bunch of banks, I'm gonna call them the walking wounded, you'll see why in a, in a, in a second. Uh, they face some probability 
that there would be a demand for liquidity on them in the near future. So uh, think of these, uh, uh, David Sharfstein and uh, 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 Ivashina have a, have a very nice paper which shows that during the crisis, there was a tremendous demand for liquidity from people, from uh, firms, for example, uh, that had been offered lines of credit. People pulled down their lines of credit for fear that they wouldn't get access to those, uh, those lines later on. So think about uh, the possibility that in this situation, we either have a generalized banking panic or we have depositors or borrowers with needs who pull out money. So the walking wounded could face a need to uh, essentially pay out in the, in the near future. If they find this need to pay out, they'll have to sell illiquid assets at fire sale prices uh, because you know, there's not enough competition among its potential buyers. BlackRock has a certain amount of capital they're going to devote to this. Uh, a few other buyers who can do it, who have the money, but many of the others who can potentially buy are in an equally bad situation and unlikely to be buyers. So a small set of buyers with the kind of uh, liquidity that they can use to buy these assets. So just like we had industry insiders earlier with cash, we have Black Rocks with cash here, but it's a limited set of buyers for the securities. So what, does this, what effect does this have? I'm going to argue that when you have the potential for fire sales, you have essentially the possibility of a total freeze in the market. And the steps are as follows. When you think there's a potential fire sale, because these walking wounded are going to sell assets in the market, it implies that there's a wonderful profit opportunity down the line for anybody who has cash, because these assets are going to be sold at bargain basement prices. So folding back to today, it certainly means that asset which could possibly be sold in the market, we're talking about CDO, CDO squared, CDO cubed, those assets could be sold at a deep discount in the future. Folding back to today, they're also discounted. But the discount in the future, when there's a liquidity need, when lots of people are selling, is going to be considerably higher than the discount today. So if I have cash today, am I going to buy these assets today or hold on to cash because there's a high return in the future? Well, I'm going to say I need a similar return if I'm going to part with the cash from any asset I invest in. And so if, for example, there's a term loan that I could make because I have plenty of cash, I'm going to demand a return equivalent to buying that asset at fire sale prices, right? So as soon as you have these high potential returns in the market, anticipating a possible liquidity shortage and the sale of assets at fire sale prices, it increases the returns for any use of cash today. What does that imply? That implies generally I hold cash because there's no loan I can make today at those rates of return which make any sense. I have a credit freeze. I have a credit freeze because I anticipate this unloading of assets. What about securities trading? I mean, what about the walking wounded? Won't they want to prepare for this potential sort of risk that people will come for their money and they go, they, they go belly up? And the answer, it turns out, is no. If they sell those securities today at the discounted price that they're at, they raise cash. But that bolsters the value of depositors rather than bolstering the value of equity. Better to hold on. If there's no shock, if I survive, those discounted assets which are selling at a low price today come back tremendously in value. And I look like a genius. I look like a genius, so do I want to support the depositors whom anyway the government will take care of, or do I want to look like a genius? Um, I think the, the choice is pretty clear. Essentially, uh, the problem is, in an environment where there's a risk that the banks will go belly up, they, if, if they sell securities today and become much more liquid, they're selling those securities at a bargain basement price, but essentially they're foregoing a put option. The option to uh, essentially default, uh, and that is a costly option for them to forego. So essentially, it's not a buyer strike, it's also a seller strike. Nobody is selling assets also because the price is too low 
given their own particular circumstances. So there's both a trading freeze, which is the guys who have these illiquid assets aren't willing to sell them, and as a result, become essentially solvent. They're willing to take the chance because they make much more riding on that. And there's a credit freeze because even for healthy banks, the rate of return on holding cash for the possibility there'll be these investment opportunities in the future, much higher than lending it out today. And so if credit dries up, you get these arbitrage opportunities because credit is simply not available to take them on. Lots of inefficiencies in this kind of framework. There are avoidable runs, too low a future price, depresses lending. And you know banks don't internalize the effects of their actions on the future solvency of banks. And credit decisions, a point that Jeremy uh, makes in his 2012 paper. Importantly, they don't sell illiquid assets today, even if it makes the bank solvent and run free. Okay? So what works in this kind of environment in rescuing the system? What prevents the freeze? Essentially, I would argue something like the stress test, which we had in March 2009, results declared in May 2009, tremendously valuable because it told the markets, looked at 19 big banks, and 10 of them were asked to raise capital. The stress test was seen as credible, but what it did was essentially told the markets, we asked these banks to raise capital. If they don't have it, we have a backstop, the Treasury's Capital Assistance Program to help them raise capital. They will no longer be the walking wounded. Therefore, there is no longer any prospect that a whole set of these assets will come on the market. There's not going to be a fire sale. Guys, the system is fine. As soon as people know the system is fine, then credit starts picking up. People start being willing to lend because these wonderful opportunities to buy assets at bargain based on prices have disappeared. Asset prices started re recovering. So um, what lessons can we take away? And I'm going to end now. Uh, so we've looked at two phases of liquidity. So what we saw most recently is anticipated illiquidity can lead to frozen markets and frozen credit. That's a bad thing. Too little liquidity can be problematic. And that is why the authorities may need to clean up the system even in the midst of a crisis. And this is important to restore lending. Lending is on a freeze because you fear that there will be fire sales going forward. So liquidity infusion or capital infusion, we can talk later if you want about the comparison between the two, they may be necessary to repair the markets to essentially unfreeze them. Now, of course, once you do a little infusion, once you repair the markets through QE1 and so on, you could ask, why not add a little more? Why not add a little more liquidity? And why not keep adding it till everything sort of becomes hunky-dory again? And that's the last part that I want to talk about. Yes, we recovered, but financial conditions kept getting easier and easier. Is that a good thing? This is a picture of covenant light loans. Remember those things which we worried a lot about before the crisis? We said covenant light loans, terrible, no, no, no collateral, no covenants, nothing. That was that little bump you see on the left-hand side. <laughs> what has happened since, we've got bigger bumps, right? I would argue that's an example of easy liquidity, that in fact, it prevents you from taking appropriate precautions it makes the system a little more fragile. So too much anticipated liquidity can be a bad thing. Now, we've had to do it as central bankers. Low for long. Yes, there's plenty of liquidity available. Go out and lend. We hope that they would lend to real assets. They would encourage investment. They would encourage growth. In the process, they also took riskier financial bets. And the question is, how do we trade these off? How do we trade financial fragility with um, uh, real activity. Uh, the primary correlate, I would argue, is easy monetary policy, though I'm perfectly happy uh, for people to say that's not what's driving the easy financial conditions. But if you accept that, then monetary policy and financial stability cannot be separated. This is something we're still debating. We have to find ways to address, because certainly in the period since the crisis, we have built up some of the fragility that led to the crisis. Now, it's not entirely the same thing. Let me, let me end by saying the good news is the banks 
aren't primarily responsible for this. It's outside the banking system for a large part. So that's a difference. And therefore, there's less of a chance we'll have the walking wounded, which creates a collapse in the system. That's, that's the good news. That's what Basel has been about all this time, about trying to remove the risk from the banking system. The problem is we don't understand too much about the risks in the rest of the system. And we don't know how much the banks will have to intervene to support the rest of the system. We've made it harder for them to intervene, but we may need them. And do we have better or worse outcomes than the, the previous time? I don't know. What is happening is liquidity is slowly uh, in the process of being withdrawn. The easy financial conditions will change. And we have to see whether this time around it is indeed different. Let me stop there. <laughs>